This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Gibor Basri, who is professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley. He is also the vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. Gibor, welcome to our program. Thanks, Harry. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in New York City, uh, and but I wasn't raised there. I left when I was about two and was raised in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado, which is now the home of Colorado State University. And, and what is the origin of your name? It's a, it's a unique, uh, very interesting name. Well, this is one of those only in America kind of stories. So my, my father is an Iraqi Jew, and my mother is Jamaican. So, but my name is, is from my father's side. So Gibor is a, is a Hebrew name that means something like strong hero. And Basri really means from Basra. Uh, so he, 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 his family was in Basra, Iraq. And, and I understand from a faculty colleague here that before World War I, the Jewish community in Iraq was the largest minority. Yeah, and in fact, they had been there since the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is a, a biblical story, really. The Jews were captured, they were taken to Babylon, then they were released by Cyrus of Persia, uh, you know, 70 years later, some of them stayed in Babylon and some went back to Israel. The ones who stayed were then a contiguous Jewish community up until uh, actually, you know, the formation of the state of Israel when they finally went back 2,500 years later. Mm -hmm. and, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, uh, the other thing that, uh, that I can mention is that we did uh, live overseas uh, for two different years when I was growing up, and that, that had a big influence on my view of the world. So we lived in Burma when I was uh, five years old, and we lived in Sri Lanka when I was 15. Mm. And in both instances, we took about three months getting there and three months getting back. Uh, circumnavigating the globe each time and so so I did get to see a lot of the world and I lived in sort of these third world countries and so that that certainly gave me a, a view that was uh, you know beyond my little upbringing in Colorado. So so you you saw so much of the world when you were younger that you had to then devote your career to studying the universe I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that's right and uh, but what I hadn't understood was that astronomy is also a very traveling profession and so I've I've traveled quite a bit as an astronomer too. Uh, we'll I enjoy talk traveling. about that in a minute. Actually. So, so what, what, what was your was your father a professor? Did I read he, that? Yes, in your... that's right. He was a professor of physics. I see. At, in Colorado. In Colorado, right? Right, right. So, was there talk about science and scientific experiments and physics around the dinner table? Yes, sometimes. Uh, he was a theoretical physicist, so he didn't actually work with any equipment. He, he was a mathematician, really. Um, but of course, he talked about the problems in physics and so on. Um, and my mother, on the other hand, was a dancer, so she, she had the arts <laughs> covered. Uh huh. And, and so the, 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 the two trajectories of their life seems like you could see how they might have influenced your trajectory. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I came to astronomy sort of myself, uh, really through science fiction. When I started reading, I found that I really liked science fiction right away. Uh, but then my father was, you know, happy to encourage my interest in the physical world and the stars and so on. So he was always in favor of my thinking about and studying astronomy. And what was it about science fiction that, that drew you in? That's, that's the hard question, is why, why that, why not something else? Um, it was something about the, you know, exploring new places, uh, the last frontier, I don't know, the, the, the idea of space caught my imagination right away. And uh, were there any teachers that you had in, you know, in high school or earlier that, that, that really were influential in, in making you uh, uh, understand a, a, 
things about science that you hadn't gotten at home? No, I, my, the science teachers in Fort Collins were not that, that exciting, but my father was. Uh, and, and then I met um, Arthur C. Clarke, he lived in Sri Lanka, so I met him uh, when we lived there, and that, that of course uh, was a huge thrill for me, and so science fiction became even a bigger part of my, uh, my thinking. And, and talk about that impact, that would be interesting. I mean, what was it like for a young person to uh, actually be into science fiction and meet Arthur Clarke? Oh, it was it was you know a tremendous thrill, and he at the time he was uh, he was working on a movie with Stanley Kubrick. Two thousand one. Two thousand and one. Yeah, he, he hadn't they hadn't finished it at the time, so he was telling me about you know what they were doing and how it was going to be really exciting and kind of groundbreaking. And so I, I I didn't see it in Sri Lanka. I when I got back to the states, I I saw it and was was tremendously impressed. But I had been a big fan of Clark before that, and so yeah, the every time we we would chat, it was just very exciting for me. I, then I lost track of him for, actually he came and visited us in Colorado uh, once after that, a few years later when he came for one of the moon shots. Um, and then I sort of lost track of him. And then uh, one of the postdoc researchers here at Berkeley, much later, this was only a few years ago, was from Sri Lanka. He knew Clark and so we got back in touch and uh, then I stayed in touch with him until he died. And was he living there? Yeah, uh, during... he was continuing to live in Sri Lanka. I see, yeah. I see. So, and then where did you do your undergraduate work? Uh, that I did at Stanford. Mm -hmm. So I, I went uh, west from Colorado and after I finished at Stanford I actually went back to Colorado for my graduate work and then I came back out to the Bay Area so I I knew two great places to live and so I kind of been bouncing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at Stanford did you go right for the science? Yeah I, I was a I, I went there intending to major in physics and and did so uh, but what happened was uh, I found it you know difficult um, and only if I was properly motivated was it something I really wanted to do and I realized the only mo motivation I have is if I could do astrophysics. Then, uh, then I was happy to do it. So that made me decide to go to graduate school in astrophysics. So, so do you think, getting back to Clark, do you think he was key to pushing you toward the stars? I, you know, that certainly reinforced my, my enthusiasm for it, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I, uh, uh, I noticed that your dissertation was on supergiant chromospheres. <laughs> what, tell us what that was about. Okay. <laughs> so uh, stars come in various sizes, and, and astronomers like to use uh, dwarfs, giants, and supergiants to sort of describe their, their, um, their, the sizes. So supergiants are just what it sounds like. They're the, the largest stars. Um, I was interested in supergiants because they were, they have really low gravities at their surfaces. Yeah. Uh, basically a supergiant, if you put it in place of the sun, it might extend out to the orbit of Mars. So it's, it's enormous star, but, but most of that is, is really uh, very vaporous. Most of the mass of the star is down near the center. Uh, and so the atmosphere where you, where you can see the what the apparent boundary of the star is, is very low density and distended, and that, that leads to some very interesting effects uh, in spectroscopy, which is the tool I use in astrophysics. And so that was my, my thesis title, that's what I wrote it on, but I, was, I actually did my first paper on our sun, and I have returned to our sun at various times during my research career. And for the most part, actually, I study dwarf stars, not, not giants or supergiants now. Let's talk about a little about doing science and, and doing astronomy. Uh, what, what are the skills required, uh, 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 analytic and other? Yeah, uh, these days if you want to be an astronomer you, you really have to have a good grounding in physics. So a lot of graduate students in, in astronomy actually are physics majors or they've had a very strong physics background. Um, astronomy works really well uh, kind of at the beginning, sort of introductory, not even non-mathematical. It's really exciting, it's fun, there are tons of great pictures and so on. Then you have to get through the physics part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that gets you know tough sledding for a while and then when you get back to graduate school you start studying uh, astrophysics again and, and, and it becomes uh, kind of less formalized. It, it depends on what kind of astronomy you're doing or astrophysics. People do theory, they do 
cosmology, they study stars, they study galaxies, study the interstellar medium. So uh, what kind of skills you need depends a little bit on what, uh, which, which of those areas you're going into. But besides, uh, besides math, which is obviously necessary, is it, is it important to have a kind of a broader cultural background? I mean, would you recommend uh, taking courses in, in areas that are not science? Well, I, I would recommend that because I believe in well-rounded people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not required for astronomy to, to do that. Um, I, think it, I think a lot of astronomers do have other interests. Um, but astronomy itself, what, what you really need uh, is not just the math, but I think some kind of a physical intuition and a, an ability to synthesize because astronomical Objects are typically complicated systems like a planet or a star. There's a lot, a lot going on. There are a lot of different things to think about. So I think the ability to synthesize a lot of different things into mm -hmm. one coherent picture, that's, that's an important uh, ability. When, when you say physical uh, intuition, explain that a little further. Um, well, let's see. I, I guess, uh, for example, in the, in the area of, of uh, what's called radiative transfer, so uh, trying to understand the light from the stars, how it comes out through the star's atmosphere, uh, gaining information that we can then get by, uh, by observing the star. Um, so, for example, uh, understanding that if it's, if it's a distended, low-gravity atmosphere, that's going to have certain effects on the spectral lines as opposed to a, a compact, dense atmosphere. You, you, you wouldn't know what those effects were until you had studied physics, but then you begin to develop an intuition about it. So you see a new spectrum and, and somebody mm -hmm. says this is such and such and you think, well, yeah, but that's, that would be, a, that ought to really look different if it was that, you know? And mm -hmm. so uh, having an intuition about, about how things work in mm -hmm. the cosmos is important because a lot of, you know, astronomy is kind of in a discovery phase. So a lot of the times you'll be looking at something that no one has ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And then, then you need your intuition to tell you sort of, what, what might this be and, and what would be the best way to investigate this? Uh, that, that, uh, at the beginning, that's sort of intuitive. Then when you get into the details, you know, then you, you get more formal or maybe mathematical, maybe instrumental, whatever it is. In, in some of your writings, papers that I read, uh, I, I, I noticed the point was, uh, which relates to this, namely that sometimes you're looking for something that isn't seen and that, therefore you look at for side effects right. from which you can theorize about what is there even though you don't see it. Right. Well, you know, astronomy at the, at the base of it is kind of like that too because we can never get our hands on, on what we're studying. So you have to infer almost everything actually from you know from rather little so we, we get uh, you know little trickles of starlight we do various things with that and from that we infer all kinds of things about what the star is doing uh, so there is you know in some ways it's all indirect in that sense we, we never get to go do an experiment there we never get to go visit the object except in our own solar system occasionally but for the rest of the cosmos it's it's all kind of a detective uh, you know, detective novel. You you have clues and you try to put together what's going mm -hmm. on, but you never get to go check, actually. So so then tell us a little about the non-academic virtues that are required to be an astronomer. You just said, uh, you just uh, uh, referred to detective work. I guess you also have to be adventuresome. Yeah, I think astronomers uh, are adventuresome. You, you know, you go on mountaintops to uh, to do the uh, observations. Uh, a lot of people I know like to hike or mountain climb, whatever. Um, and you have, to, um, uh, you have to want to sort of go, yeah, I'll, I'll use a cliche, yeah, <laughs> I just realized that's a, that's a terrible cliche, but, but that's true, you know, it, uh, that's really the attraction of it is uh, um, seeing stuff that, that hasn't been seen before, and which has been really possible in, uh, in my career because technology has improved amazingly much uh, during my career. And so we're constantly able to make observations that you simply couldn't make before. And then you see things people have never seen. Uh, are astronomers uh, uh, dreamers? Uh, I, I, in the culture, you sort of associate the stars with, with someone who is dreaming. Uh, I mean, the stars up in the sky and so on. Talk a little about that, or is that is that just a, a superficial 
comment? I think most astronomers, I'm, I'm not sure I want to say dreamers as much as sort of philosophers. I, I think when you're confronted with the cosmos, it's a, it's a sort of philosophical experience. You know, we, especially people who work on the origin of the universe, or and, and all of us are interested in, in that, or the question of you know pl other planets and life on other planets. And these are these are kind of deep philosophical questions which humanity has been asking itself, you know, forever. Uh, and so to be an astronomer kind of puts you right away into that mm -hmm. realm of sort of the these big philosophical questions. Um, and, and is it that we're so small and the universe seems to be so great and you, you're trying to understand what's out there and at the same time how we fit in, that is humankind? Yeah, I think that's one of the great puzzlements. <laughs> one get, gets early as you study astronomy. I, you know, even my, I teach Astro 10 and the first thing I talk about is sort of the scale of the universe and it's, it's very puzzling uh, why uh, we're so small and it's so big and why it's so empty you know if, if, when you when you really sit down and ask you know what's the scale of the earth and the sun and the distance between them and the distance to the nearest star you realize that the universe is practically entirely empty the, you know the old saying nature abhors a vacuum is is probably the, one of the most wrong statements that's ever been made mm -hmm. <laughs> nature practically is a vacuum there there's just little bits and pieces of non vacuum here and there and so it's yeah, it's a little hard to, to relate that to the human experience. You know, we don't we don't experience vacuum, and we, you know, things are kind of human scale for us. Uh, but when you study astronomy, you you end up thinking about really different, not only really different scales in space, but also really different scales of time. Mm -hmm. You know, you you have to start thinking. You know, sometimes a million years seems like a really short time in astronomy. Sometimes it seems like a long time. So you have to you have to be able to really be flexible about the scale that you're thinking on. How, how in, in this context, does being an astronomer change your, your values in a way? Because as you explore these great mysteries, it, it, it really must uh, focus your mind on what it all means and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, I think different astronomers have different takes on what it all means or how they deal with it. Uh, certainly, uh, for me, it's a major part of my worldview. Uh, I think I think it means. I mean, people people, for example, worry about um, you know what's going to happen to humanity and so on. Well, f from my point of view, humanity you know is going to be a brief flicker in the in the history of the Earth. This is part part of my science fiction as well, of course. But you know. Uh, Studying long time spans, it's pretty clear that human beings as we know them today aren't going to last very long on, on astronomical timescales. Maybe our descendants will, maybe they'll be far superior to us, maybe we'll wipe ourselves out, but standard issue humans are not going to last very long at all in, in, the, in the universe. Um, and so that puts a certain certain uh, perspective on it. And then as I said, the, the, the scale of things is, is Un, unimaginably vast compared to the Earth uh, and, and us, and so again, well, you know, kind of what we're doing here is really very isolated in space and time. On the other hand, here we are, and so I, you know, that leads me to the sort of thought that that we have to supply our own meaning to these things. You know, uh, asking asking these questions of the universe, you get back answers that that are inhuman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think humans have to come to their own terms with, with these things. And so I, I think it's actually very important that we uh, supply our own meaning and try to understand things on our own scale. Uh, because if you look to the universe, you're just not going to get an answer you, you can even comprehend. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed on your website there was a paper uh, uh, trying to Mathematically answer the question: Is ET out there? Oh yes, really? yes. <laughs> and and I there was some whimsy in the paper, but but it, what what about that whole problem of are they out there and are they like us and are they sending us signals? Right. Uh, I think that's a really interesting problem, and and uh, I have it on my website because it's not that hard to sort of understand what the problem boils down to. Um, so actually, we've you know since I've started my career, we've come a certain amount of the distance to a answering the question, only a little bit. But now we, when I started, I used to t teach my class. Well, we think there are probably planets around other stars, but we don't have any actual evidence of that. 
Now that's changed, so we, we know that there are planets around other stars. We know there are actually quite a few. Uh, I'm involved currently with an experiment which is now doing that same question for Earth-sized planets. So we actually still don't know what the frequency of Earth-sized planets is, but we will know in probably five years. Um, so you can do that, but then you start running into biology. So that if you have an Earth-sized planet, it's going around a star, it's the right distance and so on, what's the likelihood that life will arise? Now we have to start guessing some more, but you, you, what you can do is you can go through and you can be optimistic or pessimistic. If you're pessimistic, you can quickly show that we, we're the only life in, the, our, in our galaxy. So that's not very interesting. Uh, so the question is, what happens if you're optimistic? So you put, a, put an optimistic answer to each of these questions. You know, how many planets, how many of them have life, you know, uh, how, many, how many that have life involved to intelligent life, and so on. And then you come to a time question at the end of it. And the time question is the crucial one, it turns out. So, so depending on how long civilizations last, uh, there could be lots of them, or we might still be the only one. So you know, if, if it turns out that once you get a technological civilization, it tends to wipe itself out in a few centuries, then it's very likely we're the only one at the moment in the galaxy. And we'll wipe ourselves out, and then you know, sometime later another one will arise and immediately wipe itself out. And like little flash bulbs going off, no, they'll never get to talk to each other because they don't stay long enough. Uh, on the, and it turns out that the, the answer, if you want the galaxy to be populated with lots of civilizations that could talk to each other, they have to live for astronomical lengths of time, mm -hmm. so at least millions of years. Uh, and then being optimistic about the other stuff, then you think the galaxy is well populated. So, so it's interesting that there's all this astronomy and so on, but at the end of the day, it, it boils down to, you know, are we capable of, of being technological and not destroying ourselves? That's, that's actually the crucial question, and, 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 and how common is that? Before we talk about your research, I'm, I'm uh, curious as to how you see creativity in astronomy, is there is there something unique about the work there, or is it like creativity in the other sciences? I, I think it's like creativity in the other sciences. I think uh, each scientist has a certain fund of knowledge that they draw on. They have a certain class of problems that they work with. Uh, and if they're a good scientist, they're kind of up to speed. So they know kind of where the frontier of knowledge is. Uh, and then you just need to identify a problem that is both interesting to you and interesting in, in your science and work on that. Uh, and but the you know the exact way you go about it is very different in the different sciences. But I, I think the creative process itself is probably similar. Now, in talking about your research, uh, and again, I'm not a scientist, but but I found your work uh, fascinating. And you, you've been involved in the debate uh, about what is a planet, uh. <laughs> and 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 I think that's a, a nice entry point in. in to your own research in, in brown dwarfs. What, why, why do we have to answer that question about what is a planet and, and why all these fights? Okay, uh, well that, you know, that's partly caused by our, our advancing knowledge. Uh, so I came into the debate, uh, as you mentioned, from, from, the, uh, from the upper end, that is from brown dwarfs, which are objects that are more massive than planets but less massive than stars. Uh, so brown dwarfs weren't known until 1995 or so. I was one of the early discoverers, and I've worked on it for uh, since then. Um, and then as we as we got so we, the first brown dwarfs we discovered were nearly the mass of stars, and then we began to work our way down. Uh, they're harder to find if they're you know smaller and fainter. So it took a while, but you know finally we we found ourselves entering the domain where they were so small. Or so, so low in mass that you wondered whether they weren't really the same as planets. Uh, so people, uh, and, and there was a, and the idea that, so what makes, what, what is different about a planet and a brown dwarf and a star? And the, the idea was that stars certainly, they, they are powered by fusion. Uh, planets certainly are not. <laughs> so, so, and brown dwarfs it turns out, uh, have have some fusion, but then they they lose it after uh, a little while. So that that was intermediate. So it seemed like fusion was a good good dividing line between planets and, and brown dwarfs. But we we eventually began finding objects which seemed to be so low in mass that you don't expect from theoretical grounds that they would ever have fusion. And then the question was, 
okay, what are we going to call those? You know, are they, and they, and they weren't necessarily orbiting stars, they were just sitting there by themselves. So were they free-floating planets? Were they sub-brown dwarfs? So there began to be arguments. And of course, uh, part of it had to do with sort of the public relations value of it. So if you, if you found another brown dwarf that was very low mass, that was one thing. If you found a free-floating planet, that was much more exciting. You know, you'd get in the newspaper more easily. And so people began claiming that, and other people began saying, well, I, that's, that's not sensible. You can't have free-floating planets, or we shouldn't call them that, or whatever. They're not made the same way that planets are made. Meanwhile, in our solar system, discoveries were happening you know, out beyond Pluto. People were beginning to discover uh, lots of objects out there. And eventually, of course, they started growing in size. Uh, and, and finally, one was found that was larger than Pluto. And the question was, uh, is that the 10th planet? Or, or should we actually kick Pluto out of the planet mm -hmm. domain as well? And so there was a debate going on there, too. So, so those two debates together made it clear that astronomers uh, hadn't made up their minds about what a planet really is. And, and uh, so, I, as I said, I got involved from the high mass end, and so my friends were involved from the low mass end, and then we tried to put it all together. It's not a settled question, though. I, I actually was just uh, in New York in March for a, a 10th anniversary debate at the, at the Rose Center where, where they sort of started the Pluto controversy by opening this new planetarium and not calling Pluto a planet. Uh, so we were still having a debate, you know, this past March. So, so <laughs> Pluto is not, uh, I had heard of ex-presidents, but I never heard of an ex-planet. But so is it n still an ex-planet or it's still a planet? It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> so I if see. you talk to me, it's still a planet. If you talk to other people, it's an exoplanet, but it's not the first exoplanet. Actually, it turns out um, the asteroid Ceres, when it was discovered, was labeled a planet first, and in mm -hmm. fact, it was sitting between Mars and Jupiter in in an orbit where you expect, just based on the spacing of planets, to find a planet. So they found it there, and they said, "Oh, there's there's the next planet," and then, but it was awfully small, and and then there were more and more, and so they they decided to call them asteroids instead. So Ceres had already lost its planetary status. And the, the same reasoning was then applied to Pluto. They said, well, it's part of a belt of, of lots of objects. It may be the biggest one. Actually, it's not even the biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's not call it a planet. So uh, that was the reasoning uh, on that side. On the other side, uh, one could reason that um, that's not the right definition for a planet. It has to do with with uh, circum it's circumstantial. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you take the same object and you t put it away from the belt, suddenly it's a planet. You put it in the belt, it's not a planet. That doesn't seem like mm -hmm. a, a good thing for planets either. So that that's sort of what the debate's about. And because it's just a definitional debate, uh, you know, it's not really scientific. Uh, people can you know, it's a matter of taste. So some people have. Uh, like Pluto as a planet, and some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you were uh, one, uh, a discoverer of the, one of the first brown dwarfs, and it would be interesting to talk a little about how that uh, search for dwarfs came about and, and the different routes that were taken, uh, ending up with, with the, the route that you took. And, and it seemed, the, the, a lot of this is about hypothesizing right. uh, and looking for things out there. And, and the, the, talk a little about this business about uh, bipolar stars, two stars, uh, if, if I'm binary stars, bi binary, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, binary stars. If there's one, there should be another. Well, that's not really related to the it's search not, for brown okay. dwarfs. Um, the the search for brown dwarfs. Uh, so brown dwarfs uh, were expected to be lower in mass than stars. Uh, it turns out that, and because fusion doesn't remain, uh, when they first are formed, they might look like really low mass stars. But because they don't sustain fusion, then they begin to cool off, and then you know eventually they'd, they'd look more like planets, temperature-wise. And so, so there were a couple of ways to search for them. One was to just uh, look for objects that were so cool that that uh, even the coolest star couldn't be that cool. Mm -hmm. Then you'd you'd have a brown dwarf. Mm -hmm. um, but those would be very faint because they cooled off so much. Uh, the other approach, which I used, was let's look for them when they're nice and young and bright. Uh, but then the question is, how can you tell the difference between them and a star? And it turns out the element lithium uh, gets destroyed by stars, but it wouldn't get destroyed by, by brown dwarfs. And so I was looking for what appeared to be very low mass stars, but which showed lithium. 
uh, and the other people were looking for just really cool, faint things. And, and actually, in 1995, both methods paid off you know, that year, which seems to happen in science periodically. You've got a bunch of people looking, mm. and then all of a sudden it's successful you know, on several fronts. Um, so that was, now how did I get into that? Uh, it actually had to do with the, the Keck telescopes, uh, which the University of California and Caltech uh, had just sort of brought online. These were the world's largest telescopes um, because it was restricted in use to UC and Caltech astronomers. Uh, we all thought, you know, well, this is an unparalleled opportunity. We should do something really exciting with this opportunity that we have over most of our colleagues. And so I was working on uh, relatively low mass stars anyway, and I thought, oh, well, we should, mm -hmm. I should, I should uh, hunt for brown dwarfs because if I, if I do, that'll be a, a major discovery. Uh, so that's how I sort of got involved in it. And, and I decided to go the lithium route because that required spectroscopy to, to carry out, and I'm, I'm a spectroscopist, so. Do, do you name uh, the, uh, the No, we don't name the brown dwarfs. <laughs> because? Um, well, there are too many of them, potentially too now, many. Now, yeah, now that's true. Now there are too many yeah. of them. Um, and the uh, International Astronomical Union is the only body that has the official cap capacity to name astronomical mm -hmm. objects, and they they weren't naming, they, they don't name stars or, or uh, star-like things. And, and in fact, the now they have named objects in our solar system, so when exoplanets were being discovered, that was a question, should they start naming those? But, but it turned out, again, enough were discovered quickly enough they realized, no, let's not, not name them. Now they do name asteroids, and, uh, and there are tens of thousands of asteroids, so they, <laughs> they've, you know, now they're sort of, you know, the discoverer can kind of give it any, any name, and as long as it's not, you know, off color, they'll, they'll take it for the name. If I could sum up what you're saying is to, to help uh, our audience understand uh, the, w the work of astronomy, uh, the technology is opening up uh, the universe, uh, and what you have is uh, almost like a mapping exercise in a way, uh, uh, and a, a process for understanding how these objects differ from each other uh, and finding different criteria to establish their differences? Is well, that really, uh, it's astrophysics. So yeah. I wasn't actually interested in brown dwarfs because I just wanted to find out where a few were. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I wanted to study them physically. So what's different about brown dwarfs and stars? Are our theories about this mass of object correct? How do we diagnose that? Uh, and so most of the work, so I, I'm not usually the discoverer of the object. Someone else, so the, the, the first lithium brown dwarf that I found, someone else found that object. Uh, I, I took the spectrum and I, I said, oh, this has lithium, and I, you, I did the theory showing how you use this lithium test to show that it's a brown dwarf. Um, but then my interest was in the physical properties of that object and, the, and then the objects that were discovered later. So I study things like, um, the, the spin of brown dwarves and how it's related to their magnetic fields and, and the atmospheres and how the, as the temperature drops, the, uh, the gas that's in the, in the atmosphere begins to condense, actually. So that you begin to get these clouds, and they're clouds of iron and clouds of titanium mm -hmm. in, in the atmospheres of brown dwarfs. And then as they get even cooler, those turn into dust grains and condense out, and, and new things form. And we haven't yet seen brown dwarfs that are so cool that they have ammonia or water clouds, but we expect them to be out there. We just they're, they're so faint that we just haven't been able to find any yet. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is the element of the, the de detective work uh, yeah. that you were talking about earlier. And, and these are all steps to understanding what the universe is about and how right. it came into being. We really want a physical understanding of the universe. So, it's so, uh, so sometimes people draw the distinction between astronomy and astrophysics where astronomy is more the mapping exercise oh, I see, I see. and astrophysics is more about the physical properties. And I would say that you know, there are very few astronomers in that sense uh, left today. Almost everybody is an astrophysicist. We're really, we're really interested in how the universe works and how all the objects work and also how they come to be and how they die, you know, what their evolution is, their life, life cycles and so on. 
Now, you were co-investigator of the Kepler mission. Tell us a little about that, because that's where your research is going. Yes. Uh, and and uh, help us understand the importance of that and uh, the, the way your mind works in exploring this opportunity. Well, you know, it's funny that you asked that because uh, actually last week I went down to NASA Ames where the Kepler Science Center is and saw the Kepler data for the first time. Mm -hmm. and, and over the weekend I've just been like a kid in a candy shop because mm -hmm. this is another one of these uh, experiences where you're seeing data no one has ever seen before. Mm -hmm. It's of a quality and of, of, a, of a sort that simply hasn't been done. Uh, before. Uh, and this is a NASA mission. It's a NASA a, mission. With a telescope right. that is a, that is producing this data. Right. So the so and I'm you know I'm a co-investigator. It means I helped write the proposal to begin with. I had rather little to do with the building of the spacecraft and design of the telescope and so on. My role is really starting up now to understand the data. But the the mission itself is tremendously exciting. Uh, as we were talking earlier about the occurrence of life in the universe. So the Kepler mission is the mission which should tell us what is the frequency of Earth-sized planets around other stars. So that's the, that's the fundamental scientific mission of it. Uh, but the way it does that is it just simply looks at a whole bunch of stars, 150,000, uh, measures their brightness to an extremely high precision, and does so continuously for three and a half years. Uh, and that kind of data we've never had before, actually, on, on stars. Uh, so the, the data itself is just the brightness of every star uh, with very extremely high precision over a long period of time. What we're looking for is a dip in that light. Uh, if a planet is orbiting the star, every time it crosses in front of it, uh, it would knock out a little bit of light. And we, we could see that as a signature in our, in our so-called light curve. Uh, so that's the, that's the idea behind the Kepler mission. So it's a, it's a one meter, uh, diameter space telescope. It's not orbiting the Earth. It's actually sort of out in a solar orbit, sort of slowly drifting behind the Earth, uh, but pointing at a, at a fixed field of stars. So it's just going to look at those very same stars the entire time. Because you never know which star might have an Earth-sized planet. Uh, you never know when it's going to go in front of the star. So you need to look all the time at the same stars so as not to miss anything. Uh, for me, I'm a stellar astrophysicist. So the hunt for planets is very exciting, but while we're waiting for that, <laughs> we're getting all this data on all these stars. So I mean, I'm getting 150,000 stars. I'm getting a brightness measurement every half hour continuously for three and a half years. So there's a tremendous amount of potential stellar physics in that data set. Uh, and so that's, that's what's keeping me excited in the, in the meantime. You know, the whole project and the whole world really is interested in the, in the Earth planet answer. Um, but for, as an astrophysicist, I'm also interested in, the, in what the stars are doing. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you, do you begin with? Are you looking for something, or will what you're looking for come out as you familiarize yourself with the, this abundance of data? Both. Mm -hmm. So I know some of the things that I'm looking for because our sun has been observed in this way. Uh, that's the, really the only star for which we have very high precision measurements of its brightness for long, continuous amounts of time. And you see features in the, the solar light curve that correspond to sunspots, for example. If a sunspot comes around, that's a little darker than the rest of the sun, so the light in the sun drops a little bit. It turns out there are magnetic regions on the sun which actually make it a little brighter, too. So, so you see this, this jagged curve that ha actually tells you something about how modeled the uh, surface of the sun is. So I know I can look for that on, on other stars. And I don't expect every star to look like the sun at all. So, so we know we're looking for that. But I've, now I've seen the data, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of stuff in there that I actually don't have any idea what it is. Mm -hmm. It's like, why is it doing this? Why mm -hmm. is it doing that? So there, there's, you know, a, a great opportunity for discovery. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to figure it out, and it'll take us a while. But, you know, eventually I'll be able to say, well, we learned that stars also do this or that, or they have these kinds of features that we didn't expect. Um, and even there's some, some relevance to climate uh, change on the Earth. So. So in the 17th century, the sun kind of went blank and didn't have any sunspots for a while. And mm. Europe, anyway, got, got substantially cooler then. Uh, and, and people don't really understand the sun-earth connection, mm. exactly how that worked. But they've seen it happen more than once in the historical data. 
So now I have 150,000 stars, and they're kind of sun-like, uh, hmm. most, most of them anyway. I can find out uh, how many of those are kind of blank at the moment, and that, that would tell us what fraction of the time does the sun probably spend in, the, in this blank state, and you know, how likely is it that the Earth gets subjected to, to those things, um, which it, seem to change the climate. <laughs> yeah, is this, does this kind of research invite a broader interdisciplinary approach? In, in other words, is, is, is there something about this data, as you just suggested, that is going to draw other sciences in, both for helping you understand, but also in terms of, of breakthroughs in other areas? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and of course, the whole astrobiology question is, is a very broadly interdisciplinary question. So, so another thing that we're, we're expecting to see is we, we hope we'll find um, Earth-sized planets around low-mass stars. Well, they'll have to be much closer to the star to get the same amount of heat, because those are much fainter stars. And in fact, the planets will be tidally locked so that one side of the planet is always facing the star and the other side isn't. So what's a planet like that like? You know, so then atmospheric physicists need to come in and tell us, you know, what kind of winds would you have? Are they going to distribute the heat from the bright mm -hmm. side to the dark side enough to keep the planet uh, hospitable, or will the atmosphere condense out on the on the backside and freeze? And um, and then the biologists begin to start thinking about, well, what would that be like? These some of these stars have huge uh, magnetic flares on them that hit the planet with a lot of radiation. Well, you know, is that good or bad for starting life? You know, it makes a lot of complex molecules, but then it might kill bacteria. So, so yeah, there's there's a lot of interdisciplinary thinking that's beginning to happen around those kinds of questions, and I think the Kepler mission is certainly going to going to foster some of that. Uh, uh, another hat that you wear on the campus, uh, besides uh, professor of astronomy, is vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. And I think it's important to ask you: How do we uh, draw in, you know, young people, especially from groups in our society, women, minorities, and others, who who who've not been a part of uh, the excitement of science, but who have a lot to offer if they get the right training and, and focus on these problems. Right, right. So, I mean, the one, one simple way is what I'm going to do tomorrow, which is uh, actually in this building, there will be 250 uh, minority uh, students from, from around here, uh, and I'll give them a lecture about Kepler, and I hope they will see my, my uh, in, you know, infectious passion about it, and, and, I'll, and, and it's simple enough that they can kind of get the picture. Um, and they can see me that I that I look like them and I'm doing it. Uh, that's so that's a you know small thing to do, but that's one of the things. Um, I've also been on the board of the Chabot Space and Science Center, which serves you know all the school districts around here, uh, which gives them a you know a better and, and a more frequent uh, look at some of the excitement of science. Uh, we really do need. Um, to encourage more people to go into science teaching who are able to convey this excitement as well. Uh, I think, that, you know, the problem with uh, someone who lives in, in East Oakland thinking about being an astronomer is they don't know anybody who does anything remotely like that, and so it's not really in their thinking to do. Then, you know, the schools are also uh, have their, have their under-resourced issues and, and there aren't mm -hmm. necessarily good math and science teachers to inspire them. And so, so we need to, you know, the people who are doing it need to, to uh, be out there as much as possible showing that this is a, 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 an exciting and satisfying career. Uh, and we need to be working on trying to get the educational system to prepare folks so that if they choose to do that, you know, that they actually have the preparation for it. Do, do, you, do you think we have a, a, an even more difficult challenge now because of all the problems with the international economy, the national economy, and the state economy? Uh, no in, question. In the sense that, uh, it, it, in a way, it, it also takes organization and dollars to make these uh, things happen. We can't just depend on a, a charismatic scientist here or there. Yeah, that's to, right. Yeah. So, so as Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, I, I work with those programs and I see the budgets and I see what's going to happen and starting to happen uh, because of this economic crisis. And I'm not, I'm not happy about what I see. I mean, you have people who you are just 
you know, beginning to bring into the fold, and they're going to be the first ones that get left out when things shrink. You know, if you're on the margins and and the, the enterprise shrinks, you tend to get left out. And so, I'm quite worried about uh, that happening. Uh, you know, a perfect example of that is the governor's suggestion to eliminate Cal grants. Mm -hmm. That that will fall disproportionately on people of low income, and they are disproportionately, uh, you know, people uh, underrepresented minorities. And so. So, you know, something like that can have a, a large negative effect, which is hard to counter with, with what we do. But, but we'll certainly forge ahead and try to do as much as we can. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that, that, in, that the, at least now, we have the virtue of a, of a president who uh, at least will <laughs> attempt to, to motivate organizations and, and, and the system to actually try to reach out in a way that does not alienate people uh, who feel that they're being excluded because more people are being included. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dilemma. <laughs> it is a dilemma. Um, and, of course, simply by his presence, the president uh, shows that you know there's a potential for for going far to people who may not have thought thought it was there before, but yes, I also you know believe that he will he'll be more serious about putting resources where they're needed to to help uh, these populations who need more help, um, and right at the same time do so in a way that that is not too scary to the folks who are already well positioned, because they can also you know push pretty strongly against it. Uh, you know, and of course, we've seen some of that in California, like with Prop 209 and so on, uh, which definitely, you know, did have a, a negative effect on the participation of the whole population in this, especially the, you know, the enterprise of the UC system, for example. Um, so yeah, we just have to, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm, um, I was, willing to take the job because I can take that same kind of point of view. I can work with, with everybody I need to work with uh, in a reasonable fashion. Uh, I think I, th I have a basic faith in people and I think they want to see the state of California succeed and they recognize that it's a changing state. Uh, so I, I have some hope, but of course this current economic <laughs> crisis is, is going to slow things down. What would be your advice to students out there uh, who may or may not be, you know, uh, uh, minorities, but uh, who have an interest in astronomy after listening to you? How, how should they prepare for their future in astronomy? If you want to be an astronomer, you have to make sure you stay on the math track in uh, sort of middle and high school. But if you don't do that, you're kind of left out in the cold to begin with. Uh, as I said earlier, you, you need to you need to hover somewhere around physics at least to get the basics in. Now, what I told people, which was true for myself as well, uh, actually when I was in eighth grade I did a career report on astronomy because I was pretty interested at that point. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like a very good career to me at that time. It was, it was quite small, it was difficult to get into, there weren't that many jobs. Uh, and I, So I actually gave up in eighth grade on being an astronomer. Um, but I stayed in, the, in the, the math track and the physics track knowing that at least that left that option open. Uh, and then, as I said, in, at Stanford, I realized if I'm going to do physics, it has to be astrophysics, and I went back to it. Uh, even after I did that, though, I, I wasn't so sure I could end up as an astronomer. But I knew that the education I was getting would serve me well anyway. I was getting, a, I was learning a lot about computers. I, there was no question I could have become a, a, you know, a software person or a computer designer. Or, there were a number of things I could have done. So I, I fe always felt that my options were open. And I think that people who study, uh, especially the hard sciences, are attractive to business and industry. They, they develop a certain analytic way of thinking and, and a rigor of thinking that a lot of different people value. So, so I, I usually, when I talk to young people, I say, look, if you think you might want to do it, it's a good thing to do anyway. And if you don't end up doing it, you'll still be ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, and then one final question, a brief answer. If uh, Arthur Clarke 
is out there in the universe watching this program, what would you, uh, uh, what would you be your thought to him about the influence of, of science fiction and w what you do now, the, that interface? Well, I think you know Arthur Clarke uh, saw some of his his science fiction become reality uh, in his own lifetime. You know, he predicted communication satellites, for example. And I think, uh, you know, he and I talked about the possibility of life on other planets. I think he'd be really excited that we're, you know, we're just on the edge of discovering Earths around other stars. And so I would tell him, you know, uh, you experienced science fiction turning into science fact in your life, and I, and now I'm, I'm experiencing that as well. And it's a really, a really great feeling. <laughs> On that uh, uh, note, I want to thank you, uh, Gabor, for uh, taking the time to be with us today. It was a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.